2020, I had nothing but time. Like, so. Persistence of time. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, like the rest of us, yeah. I hadn't written a record since the last Shadows Fall record, and that was 2012, I think, last one. So I'm just sitting on like seven, eight years of riffs and, and songs. So uh, I'm like, you know what? I, I got I to gotta throw a band together. Welcome to 2020. This week, I am here, like every week, with Siobhan Cronin and Corey Peza. Hi, guys. Yo. Hey. I noticed you were counting our episodes, although I don't know if it was accurate or not. Corey's probably the best one to say that. <sighs> I lost track. I lost track a long time. I stopped counting eight. <laughs> I'm the guy that like, counts cards, but I'm like three off. So it's like I cut so every time. So it's basically I'm like, unsuccessful. Could've. Oh, I could have. <laughs> Pretty I sure. I could have. Yeah, yeah. A lot. So we're back this week for part two with John Denae. If you didn't listen last week, go check it in. Uh, ch- check it out. Check it in. Oh, my God. And don't forget <laughs> to subscribe, of course, at 2020-d.com. Go check out our other episodes. Watch the YouTube wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah, buy the but t-shirt with our faces on it. Right. Shannon Larkin wore our t-shirt with our faces on it. So yeah. I feel like that validates that it's least like not like a <laughs> fictitious thing. Yeah. Right. Indeed. But yeah, this great episode, John, if you if you haven't checked out the first one, go check it out. Uh he's just just a straight up like musician. Dude just just lives to rock. Yeah, down to earth. Very humble. He's just an amazing dude. He's super nice and I as fellow Bostonians, and anyone from Massachusetts calls himself a Bostonian, he's <laughs> yeah. kind of from Western Mass, but anyone from Massachusetts, he's a hometown hero, and I couldn't be more proud to see him killing it with Anthrax, one of the big four, up there with Metallica, Slayer, and Megadeth, like the, the, ba- the bands that matter outside of Pantera. Yeah. So, yeah. so without further ado, part two with John Denae. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 2020. I'm here. I'm Siobhan Cronin here once again, as always, with my cohorts in crime, my podcast hosts, my friends, my fellow musicians, my inspirations, all of the wonderful things. (laughs) Benny Goodman. Thanks, Siobhan. That really, 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 (laughs) truly made my day in a a way that only (laughs) Chicago can. (laughs) And also Corey Peza. Cheers. (laughs) Well, I don't even get a verbal hey. <laughs> <laughs> ben, ben stole all the words, so I don't got anything okay. left. <laughs> and back for another episode. We just interviewed him for part one, part two now with John Denae of Shadows Fall, Anthrax. Also played on Lost Symphony, Murder of Crows. If you haven't checked it out, please go check it out. Chapter um, two. Lost Symphony, chapter two. Um, yeah, so welcome back. Thank you so much for being with us once again. We got into some really... Interesting stories in part one. Can't wait to dive back in. For anyone watching the YouTube cast, Corey's holding up our our CD. So go buy it if you haven't. Please. <laughs> and subscribe yeah, to the podcast. If, if you're a guitarist, you got to listen to that record. It's, man, it's, it's got some of the best guitars you'll ever hear on it. I mean, it's Noodle Benton Court, Jeff Lillman, Friedman, Marty Friedman. Like, the best of the best. Are yeah, involved absolutely. in that. yourself as well, man. You did a you did a great job. Yeah, yeah. I got lucky. <laughs> I, I, I knew somebody. I know people who know people. <laughs> well, Ben, maybe you can tell us how you and John met because, like, I don't even know this connection. Like, how did how did this happen? Well, the first time that there's a difference between when I met John and when John met me. <laughs> <I think laughs> because that's the case with I <laughs> saw John, I want to say in like '97 at the Palladium, um, in Worcester. Because Shadows Fall was playing there all the fucking time. Yeah. And that, was, and that was a place that, by the way, um, it's one of the greatest live venues on the planet. And it also, like, if you played hard enough and loud enough, the, you could go up to the backstage and the roof would literally would come down. Like, Cinder would come from yeah. the roof. Because yeah. you would shake it so hard with your double bass that the, 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 you could yeah, see through the, yeah. There's no chilled out in those dressing rooms. <laughs> and you were at the fucking show when yeah. you were backstage. Really. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> so I think I think I saw John there. And then, uh, look, John has always been like an untouchable level guitar player. And I think that um, it was probably our, our our mutual friend Mark 
uh, Lopes from Let Us Pray, from Ross the Boss. Like, mm-hmm. you know, unbelievable, unbelievable vocalist. And also, like, metal persona. Like, let's just be honest. Like, he's the metal persona. Oh, like, yeah. If, if there's any guy, like, if there was, like, a metal incarnate that on behalf of the human race, like to explain metal to aliens. And I'm sure you'd be excited about this. If, <laughs> if you sent a human to space to share what metal is and the, the value of Bruce Dickinson and man of war, it, it yeah. would be Mark Lopes. He, so he, he, he's the guy to sell it. Yeah. So I think, I think I have a picture of myself and this is a great picture. And I've, I have talked about this picture where you're wearing an anthrax um, persistence of time. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I sure. remember that you sent me that photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I want to say Mike Turbane was wearing a Shadows Fall shirt, and he ended up yeah. joining the band, and you ended up I joining think, the band. I think that was at the, on the Five Finger Death Punch tour. At the, that was on uh, that, House yeah, of Blues. That was yeah. It was at Rock. Yeah, the House of Blues, mm-hmm. Avalon House of Blues. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, since then, and then I, I begged him, and it was really Jimmy Bell. So one of the things that's great about Murder of Crow. So if you haven't listened to Chapter Two yet, um, get on it. Um, but that song in particular is, is exceptional. And it's because, um, we know we, John was alluding to it earlier. There's like different styles of players. First off, we have John's old guitar teacher. And I don't mean old because he looks fucking amazing and he plays faster than fucking ever. Uh, Jimmy Bell, who now plays with Incredible. autograph, but that dude Incredible. is the f- fast he, he he looks at matt lapierre who played on the record and he's like mm. going like oh i can't do any of that sweet picking stuff or whatever like you don't need to dude you no, literally just don't need to. to pick everything yeah uh, as fast make, as a sweet jimmy makes shit harder than it needs to be and he plays it perfect <laughs> oh like he digs yeah. into it to the point where like you feel bad for the pick he's like did i get it and then, and then he's so humble he'll call you later like betty do you do you think we got it like are you sure we got like when we had gotten it like like hours before, like, are you sure you don't want me to come back? I could turn I could turn around. Like he was like so self deprecating. But we have Jimmy Bell, we have Matt Bashand, uh, or Tim Osmond, who was in Shadows Fall, and I had this half baked idea, like what what if we got you guys back together for a song, which now you guys are back in living wreckage in a band together. Yeah. Uh, but what's it like, at least with Lost Symphony coming in and you're playing on a song with Matt? And you're playing on a song with Jimmy Bell and obviously Siobhan and yeah, well, Kelly. I'm, I was super psyched to to, <laughs> to to be on that track. Um, you're a bass player, whatever. Jimmy, man, I I remember he was the guy when I would take lessons from people you know, as a teenager. He was like this guy that he wasn't even real because I never saw him. But everyone was like, "Oh, the stuff you like, you got to see Jimmy Bell. Jimmy Bell, Jimmy Bell from everyone." But um. We were kind of in different areas. He was in Connecticut, I was Massachusetts. And by the time I was playing clubs, uh, whatever my style was, or my shadow fall, we weren't playing with any of his bands. So I still never got to see this guy. And then one day, one of my friends was like, let's go check out Jimmy Bell. So I went to a bar and I was like, holy shit, like, this is not even real. His hand looked like a hummingbird. Like, yeah. I couldn't even, like... <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It, it was going so fast. I'm like, I can't even... Can I tell you he who he sounds like to me? He sounds like if you took Richie Blackmore, Ingve Malmsteen, and Brian Setzer and put them and all then, together. Like, this evil the- 50s, like, rock- like, rockabilly, shred classical blues. But, and then, so Paul Gilbert, because it's precise picking like alternate pick everything yeah like Nuno like, Betancourt like Paul Gilbert level precision yeah yeah he, he's one of the best I've ever seen and on top of that like not a little bit even ego even which is crazy that like a guy like that just, just doesn't I, I mean I wouldn't even let anyone have my phone number if I could play like that so <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we had <laughs> We had so much fun with him uh, in the studio. And like you said, Ben said, he's, he's just kind of like, oh, I, was, I don't know if that was good enough. Our jaws are on the floor. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. It's just, <laughs> it's shit like that you see on TV and not in front of you. Yeah. Well, then, I actually so- started filming him because he does this Steve Morse, like uh, almost like economy picking thing that like he go kind of up and down that I started like filming with my phone because I was like, wow, the angle at which he was doing it, it was like some sort of scientific way of like getting under and out like so fucking fast but here's the thing that i love about jimmy bell 
um, is the same thing about Joey Concepcion is when they came down for the first time with Lost Symphony. They had, you know, he had his max explosion and then some stuff, but he didn't have the autograph. And he said that one of the reasons he got the gig was the video that I posted of him playing Murder of Crows, the song that you're on, 90% of the solo is one take of him just fucking owning it. And it had yeah. like 5,000 hits on my page, my personal page that gets like six hits because no one cares. But they care about Jimmy <laughs> Bell because everyone cares about Jimmy Bell. And he was like, yeah, I think they saw, I think they saw me play on that. And uh, that, you know, I got a call and I, I can't tell you how excited I am. It's the same thing with Joey Concepcion. He came down here when we had all, when Ollie was here. And he was yep. like, had his back to us because he was like all nervous because we had Matt LaPierre and Ollie. And he was like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know. And he's pulling out like this perfect, almost Ingve Jeff Loomis shit. Like, yeah. first time. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then like two years later, I find out the guy's playing like Wacken Open Air Festival yeah. for, so Jeff for Jeff Loomis. Yeah, and he does it note for note perfectly, like no big deal. Like, yeah. dude, if you gave me $10 million, held a gun against my head and said that you're going to cut my cat's head off. I couldn't play one Jeff Loomis solo. No, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I can't, I couldn't, I, I, like I said, I'm terrible at playing shit note for note, so that, that would, I'd be dead. <laughs> but the, uh, the cool thing about Murder of Crows that, y that you and Jimmy uh, that were on is that it's, I think it's one of our, uh, one of the only few songs we have an actual full video for that shows Mm -hmm. actually shows human beings playing instead of like animated corpses. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put a link to it, but you guys, you got to check out John, you got to check out Jimmy. Um, it's murder of crows by lost symphony uh, on chapter two on chapter two yeah. on, on YouTube. Check out the video. We've had a bunch and the of times. The funny thing is that I'm probably doing a bunch of Jimmy bell licks <laughs> on it. Like that. He show me. Yeah. <laughs> well, the great thing is the, the the best time ever is when I send Jimmy Bell mixes and he calls me back and goes, "Oh, Benny, uh, I you know I didn't I didn't remember doing the song, but like I I, I heard it, I was like, oh yeah, that's me, that's definitely me, because okay. you don't mistake Jimmy Bell no. because that's sure. one that's yeah. that's another thing. It's like we have him on a song sandwiched in between like uh, Marty Friedman and like you know a bunch of crazy player and Kelly. And all that. Well, that's but, a, Marty the same way. You hear Marty, and it, like absolutely. it only takes five seconds until you know. Yeah. It's Marty. You know it's him because he bends right into it. But yeah. after Marty plays, for you to go on stage and then own it the way that Jimmy does, like he does solos that even afterwards you could go, okay, the, the not that that competed or contended. Like some people may even like it better, and I'm not saying you should or should not. But the fact that Jimmy's like makes me ponder in my mind: was that as crazy as what Marty Friedman just did? And then he like looks at himself surprised because he doesn't even remember that he did it because he just plays it off the top of his head because yeah, he practices he, every day. If you go to his page, he's literally sitting oh yeah, there without like the amp on, yeah, without the yeah, amp on, just playing these rockabilly fucking murderous arpeggios up and down the neck faster than any. Like it looks like stop start motion. It's fucking yeah, outrageous. He, he used to tell me he used to drive with you know remember those practice deck things that he had. Oh yeah, he, yeah, he the just jam used to, stick or something. He'd drive like around with shred neck, you know, so shred neck. Yeah, and just go up and down while he's driving. Well, he's walking 12 miles a day a now. Well, that's the other thing. Is, so since he's done this, he's become a real rock star and he wants to live it again. So like, you know, he was in a movie with Joan Jett and Michael J. Mm -hmm. Fox back in the 80s. And like, he was so close. He was the contender to Zach Wilde, which by the way, right. I feel like Jimmy sounds like Zach Wilde, but like during the best period of Zach Wilde and then on Royce, because I actually feel for me, that Jimmy Bell is one of the only human beings on the planet that can alternate pick like Zach Wilde and maybe even then some. And yeah, uh, I, I, I think Jimmy Bell might be the, at least a guy that I know who sat in front of me is the craziest alternate picker I've ever seen. Yeah. And yeah. It's, so, I mean, and, and then, the, and then the fact that now he's playing with autograph, which I mean, he's like the rain. Well, I don't want to say Randy Rhodes because like, I don't want anything to happen to Jimmy, but like, he's like the best thing that's happened to autograph in so long because like, you know, I, I've been watching like their shows uh, online and all that. Like, you know, he does like this, like guitar solo live. And it's like so few people can pull off a live guitar solo, especially in a legacy band. And if I mm -hmm. never heard autograph in my life and I, and I heard Jimmy bell playing what he plays with that band, I would stop what I was doing and go, Holy Not shit. Good. And this, and, and he now walks 12 miles a day. He's what he's back to the same weight. He was when he was 26 years old. He's 60. He's 60. He might even be older than 60 and he looks fucking 
unbelievable. And he works yep. for it. And he and he and he thanks everybody. He carries all his own shit. He's just the nicest dude. And it's Very one humble. of those guys mm -hmm. that he worked by literally putting a penny in everyone's jar for years to get to where he is. Right. Yeah, he he deserves a way more even. Like he should have been a fucking like everybody should if you play guitar and you like hard rock, you should know Jimmy Bell is. Little Murder of Crows, lostsymphony.com. And you can hear John Denae and Matt Bichand back together. So, can we talk about this new band, Living Wreckage? Yeah, I wanted to ask You had sent that. me yeah, some sure. demos back in the day, and, uh, dude, is, uh, I, I guess I'll have you explain it before I give you my thoughts on it, but, like, what started this band, and, like, what were your influences and thoughts now that you've had time to start something completely new now that Anthrax hasn't dominated your life for a year? Right, so, I mean, 2020, I had nothing but time, like, so, Persistence of time. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, like the rest of us, yeah. I hadn't written a record since the last Shadows Fall record, and that was 2012, I think, last one. So I'm just sitting on like seven, eight years of riffs and, and songs. So uh, I'm like, you know what? I, I got I to gotta throw a band together when I, when I got home. And uh, that was my goal anyways. After Anthrax got torn, I'm like, I, I want to, I want to put a band together and, and uh, get these songs out. And then COVID hit, and that's all I did was spend my time doing that. And I was jamming with John Morenci, who's also he's one of those guys that plays everything. He's awesome at everything. He's just awesome. I hate people like that. Also but I love played the guy. in like, Let Us Pray um, yeah. with Mark Lopes, so that brings it back to that connection. Because John, well, let me give you an example of what John does. John will send me, he'll go, "Hey man, can I send you a track?" And then it's like a nine minute long, like Nintendo mashup <laughs> that's like yeah. eighty seven million tracks, perfectly coordinated. He plays every instrument from the right. drums to the bass to the guitars. He does, and everything's perfectly thought out. And you're just like, yeah. I, first off, I hate you, and secondly, lose my email address. <laughs> Yeah, I believe he went to Berkeley, so I think he's like, no, he knows all that stuff and uh, schooled guy, and but he's very rock and roll too. And so I just started jamming with him, and we got some songs done. And then uh, I always knew I wanted Matt involved, but Matt at the time was also going to school and working full time, so it was really hard for Matt uh, to jam at the time. So I didn't know whether I just wanted a one guitar band because it's hard to find another guitar player. Like I was so used to playing with Matt. It's hard to find a, a guy that you're going to gel with when you have two guitar players. Um, so I was like, maybe it'll just be easier. Sometimes you have one guitar player, you, you know how everything's supposed to be played and it's going to be played the way you want. But uh, John told me about this guy, Matt. Uh, Matt LeBreton, who played in a band called Downpour with Brian from Shadows Fall. So there's kind of that, that connection right there. So uh, I was like, yeah, well, I, I dig that stuff. That so was a really cool band. So I was like, yeah, come, come down to my house and we'll jam. And us three just hit it off. And we just started just mowing through songs. And Matt had a bunch of shit himself. So we just started mowing through stuff. And then... Uh, Matt was friends with the singer Jeff, so he came down and and then uh, once Matt Matt just graduated from school, and so Matt Matt came in a little later, but Matt became this awesome bass player. Uh, he's not just playing what the guitar is doing; he's he's writing bass lines, which is yeah. I, I think is mm -hmm. lost in a lot of metal today. Definitely, uh, sure. a lot yeah. of the stuff re really sticks out, and it's really thoughtful, and not just not just a background instrument like like. I think it is for a lot of. You're not just a guitar people. slash bass player. You're a bass yeah, player slash guitar but, player. Right. He 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 thinks about his bass lines and just. Isn't. Does he play with a pick? He does. Oh, I don't know. There's Steve Harris nothing, approves. Nothing John. wrong. With that. Nothing wrong. With no, like no. David Elson goes on and on about how he plays with a pick, and I've seen him play with fingers. So I it like could be both, done. though. But I I see. I love. Cliff Burton and I love Jason Newstead. No, I, I don't think you, I don't think the pick makes a difference as far as I think it's 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 all tone in your fingers, like yeah. you said. And there are people that play with picks that are great. Well, and then there's Jaco Pistorius. Yeah, and also, yeah. and this is just a you know, as a bass player, it's like 
it's a tool. What sound do you want? Do you want like a bass player and a tool in the same fucking thing? Surprising. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like your pick gives you a certain sound. Your fingers give you a certain sound. Like you know, it's a different flavor. But yeah, the, I I feel like that's such a. Uh, uh, ridiculous cliche of like, oh, they're not. It's it's we're t- going back to the the arm folded guys, right? Yeah. yeah, he's not. He's using a pick. He's not a, like. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, those type of people are. You just you're never gonna win. So, uh, well, that's why I DJ, dude, because I can always win. All I do is win. I put that song on and I win every time. And then September, because like, let me tell you this, dude, no matter how good you are, no matter how good Charlie is on the drums, no matter how awesome Frank Bello is on bass, no matter how incredible Scott Ian is, you're not going to beat September. That song. Do you remember? Yeah, like, but in the same can't, way, you can't, in you the can't same ever way, beat that. in the same way that a band gets, you know, the dudes <laughs> okay. with long hair with their arms folded, you get the, uh, the crazy aunt that doesn't like the music you're, uh, playing at the, at right. the wedding. You don't like wedding. this WAP song by <laughs> Cardi B? <laughs> <laughs> can't you play some good music? Well, I love when people come over and they, they and they ask you to play like more up tempo stuff when you're like playing stuff at like 140 BPM. And you're like, what do you define as up tempo? Yeah. Right. Like some Jay Z, like that's 80 BPM. We're at 140. <laughs> so unless I cut, subdivide this rush style at 70, but you, you would count this at yeah, 140. Find something with blast beats for the next song. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have you play some death metal at my wedding, Benny. Dude, listen, <laughs> I gotta up. tell you the best. We're for, uh, Jason Costa is a good friend of the show and obviously played on Lost Symphony and our friend Adam, I tell this story all the time, um, got married. He's in a band called Backstage Pass. He's an unbelievable fucking guitarist, but he just, you know, decided to get his doctorate and become like a surgeon so and make gajillions of dollars. So like, Smart why? Move. You know, but... Uh, the the point that I'm getting at is uh, I lost it again. You Corey. were DJing this wedding. Oh, DJing yes. this wedding. Right. <laughs> so all night, all night, I'm DJing, I'm playing whatever, and then after everyone leaves, like Adam comes over and goes, "Hey man, you got any metal?" I'm like, "I got a Do fistful I? of metal, dude. <laughs> I got a fistful of it." And he's like, "So I start playing, but like, so I do the same thing because." that I do with pop music, which is nobody has any attention span. So I go from like, you know, the best, the climax of seasons uh, in the abyss to like rainbow in the dark into like, you know, the, the best part of I'm broken. And Jason Costa, who's about three bottles of Crown Royal in, walks <laughs> over to me. It's just a light, it's a light night what, for man? him. Right, yeah. You know what, man? You're pretty good at this. <laughs> you're you're pretty good at this. And we played in bands together. We played on songs together. He's seen me play piano and guitar, and he's come to my shows. Whether we played in all these different bands, and he's never come up to me personally and been like, like, take me aside. Other than one other time when he came here and did 2020, and he said after he got interviewed, he goes, "Dude, listen, you know, you play some good music with some people and stuff like you know Marty Friedman, whatever, but this." This DJing thing, this talking on the computer, <laughs> that's what you should be doing. Yes. I'm like, I don't know how I should feel about this. Like, so I'm a great DJ and I'm great at yelling in my, in my basement, but my Marty Friedman, Nuno Betancourt music doesn't live up to your standard. So like, that's why being a DJ is what you should do because the bar is set very low. Yeah. So get rid of that anthrax gig, John. And, and I think that's still yeah. too high for me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> The irony is, is that people don't realize that, that the high paid DJs probably get paid as much as some of the high paid bands. Not like the high, high echelon, but like yeah, they'd be probably. amazed. Like there are people and that. Then you make, don't have to split it with anybody. Yeah. Right. What's the bet? Yeah. I you actually. Have, I, I, I mean, what do you need? Like one other person? You don't need a road crew. Dude, so Cascade, DJ Cascade, he's not DJ Cascade because people just know him as Cascade. Um, plays in, in Vegas <laughs> two times a night, four hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars, and he gives a hundred grand to his like like manager and four hundred, and then all he does is just he has a back line of just he brings his laptop and then just plugs into the the, the turntables that are yeah. like the CDJ that are already there. Anyway. I just want to be the front of house engineer for those gigs. So like, I remember right. being in yeah. Park City, Utah, and we went to go see Camp Freddy. And we're like, Steve Stevens is upstairs and, you know, uh, Mark McGrath and, and, and Matt Sorum. And nobody cared. 
We went downstairs and little John, Lil John, was DJing <laughs> and little everyone John. was going bananas. <laughs> and with Lil John, it was his birthday. And I'm with Drew Ann Rosenberg nonetheless, and we're dancing. And I remember, and Paul Geary, and I remember going up to Paul Geary and saying, dude, you got all those rock stars upstairs and everyone's dancing to the DJ that's not even playing his own genre of music. Right. I'm like, this is this is your proof of concept. And that's scary. I'm talking to the guy that manages Joe Perry and Johnny Depp, and we've just come upstairs from seeing all these legendary rock stars to watch Lil John from The Celebrity Apprentice uh, DJ non-genre related music and I'm dancing with Drew Ann Rosenberg and she's loving it and didn't give a fuck about anything else. Yeah, it's crazy. that's sad. It is. But that's the world. I mean, I live in Miami and that's how it is everywhere here. I mean, there's not like, you can't find a rock concert in Miami. I mean, you can find maybe some jazz or something, but yeah, yeah. it's just like it's all reggaeton. everyone wants a DJ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, live ba-do, music ba-do, or house ba-do, music. Ba-do, ba-do, yeah. ba-do. But One thing I love about <laughs> about Europe is you could find rock and metal bars everywhere. I, yeah. I mean, I wish that was like that in the U.S. where you could just be like, I know, you just go in and like, all right, where's the metal bar? So yeah. it's like two blocks that way, and like, and it's just awesome seeing a bunch of people get drunk and listen to Iron Maiden and Pantera. But I wish I had something like that in my town. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, do you like touring in Europe better than the U.S. or do you have like a preferred? you know, geographic uh, region? No, at first I didn't like going to Europe because I felt so far away from my family and, and friends and you'd have to go to a pay phone and I'd have a list of like the, the numbers of how to try to call the U.S. and I could never fucking figure it out <laughs> and the time difference and you always got someone's answer machine and you could never get one on the line. So it was a huge pain in the ass and you just felt so disconnected. Yeah. Um, but now, you know, with phones, it's like, it's not any different than being in the U.S. because, you know, I can FaceTime you anytime and all that. And it's no different than being on tour in the U.S. at this point. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that that way, obviously, you know. Uh, well, how are the crowds? Because, I mean, people yeah, always say that, you know, uh, that obviously in Europe that there's this thought process in the U.S. that metal's bigger over there. And then I hear all these uh, thoughts that, like, no, it's not real. That's not really the case. Is metal bigger in Europe and when you go and play with Anthrax, are the crowds bigger there? Are they? What's the difference? Uh, I just think maybe the festivals are, but now I think the U.S. is starting to do those kind of festivals, uh, those big where you have got a bunch of bands on it. Now I think that uh, now that Ozfest and Mayhem aren't around, now they're just kind of setting up festivals all across the U.S. and starting to be maybe they they took that from Europe. Montreal has a lot of really good festivals that they've been yeah, doing, like Rock Montreal I, I and the Amnesia Festival. Rock I Montreal is sick. I can't think that that Europe and that they ever had like an Odds Fest or a Mayhem tour, and, you know, where it's the same lineup all right. for like six weeks. Well, you, know all who across should, Europe. You, you know who should tour? I put, took this off my wall as a suggestion for you. <laughs> uh, dude, that's my two favorite bands right there. And actually, it was funny because we actually just covered um, Skid Row and Scotty Hill like commented on it and i i told him it made my life and he said that like oh you should probably have like higher priorities and i completely turned it around on him and he thought that like i like was offended or something and like inbox me he's like i'm sorry i'm like dude i'm so happy i'm talking to you right now I'm like, I, I, keep going, I keep going from you. being pathetic yeah. to being funny to being pathetic with him i think scotty hill writes the best ballad souls ever i don't like, he, he writes my Man, did you hear the, the Slay at Home though. that we did with Lost Symphony? Have we did we did we did two Skid Row tunes? Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. But Siobhan like, it makes it better. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> with Shinny yeah. Kimmelman, by the way, who's an up and coming star. I think uh, Scotty. I think he's uh, really underrated. I think both Snake and Scotty are underrated guitar players. I mean those those leads that they did are, are classic. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to the project you're working on now, we kind of got derailed. So, you, you know, you, you came back and you were at home, obviously, you had a bunch of ideas, started writing. So h- how did all of this, like, continue to come together and where, where is it at now? So then um, we started Demo Out Songs and uh, we were working with Matt was help. We were doing some demos at Matt, the other guitar player's house, and then with uh, Chris Rosati from Death Ray Vision. He was helping us out with our demos and. We were really liking the way stuff was coming out. Um, I kind of wanted to do a, a band that was 50-50 heavy metal, hard rock, um, heavy riff-driven band. 
with mm-hmm. uh, killer rock vocals. And uh, so we had a demo about four or five songs. We're like, all right, we'll go into the studio and try to get five or six songs done and just have a demo and we'll be able to show people what we sound like. And then once we got to the studio, we were just cruising through stuff. So we just kept it. And before we know, like we were there for like a couple of weeks and had nine songs. That's so, amazing. Uh, yeah. Now we have nine songs and uh, we're going to let people start hearing it soon. And uh, I don't know, hopefully somebody will want to work with us. <laughs> how, how would you describe the music? So, Cause I've listened to it. and I have my thoughts on mm-hmm. it, but yeah. Uh, so you- I, I could kind of say it fits somewhere like that poster. I said, I think it fits somewhere between Skid Row and Pantera. It's a good, it's a good place to sit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah dude, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, so I mean, having listened to it, there's a lot of power groove there, which like, I mean, that's something that one, I've always loved about Charlie from Anthrax um, mm-hmm. uh, because he got it like Vinnie Paul and, you know, obviously Vinnie gets a lot of credit for this and, and a lot of people don't even realize how much Charlie plays guitar as well. So like, he's definitely, yeah, he's, he's um, one of those guys too, that just plays everything and super good at it. But when people a lot of the times think power groove, they go Vinnie Paul. But like Charlie's been doing the power groove and the amazing, amazing drum stuff. Like again, one of the reasons I I, I loved Anthrax when they when I was growing up was like a song like uh, Room for One More. You listen mm-hmm. to the drums at the beginning of a song like that, or um, you listen uh, to a song like uh, uh, There's just so much stuff that he does that has so much groove. And when you listen to the stuff that you're doing now, it has groove. Your singer sings. Which is also a nice thing. Like I feel like my mom when I say this, but I'm so sick of metal bands uh, that don't sing. And I understand, like you know, look, Shadows Fall is a really heavy band, and like there's definitely a crowd for heavy. But yeah. I like you melodic. I like hearing your riffs with more melodicism to it. And I thought that the songs were catchy, and that doesn't mean shit, you know, because like uh, who knows what's gonna be popular. But like the tunes, as far as songwriting is concerned, like they were stuck in my head. Well, that, that's yeah. good, because that's what we're going for. And like I said, I wanted it to be 50-50 hard rock heavy metal, and I wanted a melodic singer, but it just he, he could still do the heavy stuff, but it's like uh, we use it as seasoning and not, you know. Yeah, it's like stuff. the double bass all the time versus yeah. like, you know, when they, it comes in and one at the end of seven minutes of that tune, it's like, okay, there's some dynamics, and all of a sudden it's yeah. like, this is impressive. I think we try to look at that for everyone, same with drums and the guitar. Like, you know, myself and Matthew, the guitar player, we, we want to burn too, but we don't just want to burn all the time. You know, want, want to have a hooky solo and something that you can remember and air guitar too. And same with John on the drums. If you're just fucking going around all the time and <laughs> I mean, so, well, John you know, plays very, like, uh, one of the things I like about Paul in Lost Symphony is the same thing I like about John, is that he plays, I don't want to say busy, but he plays like at a crazy level, but it's melodic to the tune. He's so right. smart, he like is able to pick up all the accents and the nuances, and you can hear in his playing, and that's also true in, of, of all the things he's ever sent me, because he's playing every single instrument, that like you could tell that he... He's not just playing like I want to play a blast beat and play over everybody. He's literally thinking like a guitar player as much as he's thinking yeah. like a bass player when he's playing the drums. Well, so he's such a he, he's such a good guitar player. Like and, and jam with him, it takes him no time to to figure out a riff. Like alien. If I, if I didn't have the riff, like say uh, Matt came up with the riff, and then like John's picking it up faster than I am, I'm like. <laughs> I'm sitting there like, where, where the fuck's it? The one and John's like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> yeah, <Why not? laughs> yeah. No, I think if you're if you play multiple instruments, there's like something you're able to kind of connect like different elements in your head in a in a yeah. certain way that that seems it, to just you have, you have more holistic view of what's going on. Yeah, so I I I, I totally agree with that, and I just got super lucky that um, I found these bunch of great cool guys that wanted to do the same thing I did. And uh, one of the things is I, I didn't want to, I wanted to have a band that got back in the basement or, and, and jammed again and not just, I didn't want to, uh, I, I, I know a ton of guys that I would like to be in a band with, but we don't live near each other. Right. And I well, didn't, like I didn't us, want, yeah. yeah. And I didn't want to have to be like, oh, well, you email me your song yeah. and then I'll email you my song. And then that's what I, I wanted to just like, all right, let's crack some beers, get in the basement. 
I'll show you my stuff. You show me your stuff. We'll see what the hell happens. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Cause I wanted to ask you about the writing process um, for you and how that works. Cause I, we've heard that a lot where there is sort of a magic in getting together in person and that chemistry yeah. of a band. I think so. Like that's the only way I've ever done it. So I didn't want to do it any different. And even if I, at first I had the majority of the stuff because I had that stuff sitting around for a long time, but once we got everyone else involved, everyone adds their own thing and it becomes something different than, yeah, than what you that's... originally had in your head. And I like that because it would be something that I would have never came up with. I had it in my head how it goes, but now this guy's bringing in this stuff, this part, and it totally changed it and it's better. But I would have never thought of that. Yeah. You you saying that it's it's funny that how that just affected me the fact I realized I haven't like cracked beers and jammed with other musicians in yeah years. it's almost years. like a lost art now dude because it's, it's so easy. insane and, and it's yeah. so funny real you quick, say that I want to Ben before you go just yeah, real quick no. Siobhan have you ever jammed with anyone in other words like just walked into a room no one had any plan of like what they're gonna play and you guys just worked something out. You know, not that I can really recall. I feel like it might have happened with people right. that I've played next with. Next time, like next time you're up here, we're cracking beers and we're gonna jam. It's gonna <laughs> yeah, happen. So we I, should. I was just saying <laughs> this the other day that, like, uh, to one of my friends, um, uh, that I'm, I don't know what to do with myself because on one level, I have reached a point where I send stuff to Jeff Loomis and he writes back to me and we have like an open conversation and I'm, I'm like I'm friends with him. Like I actually am friends with him. I send him a lap steel and a, a sitar. And like we we go back and forth. He sent me a link to go listen to Kathy. I gotta I gotta find my bucket for all the the, the names that Ben drops no, in the episode. I know, right, but, I but know. I'm saying, and then and then, and then I <laughs> sent the funny. song to Nuno, and I'm writing with him, and I I would should be happy, but I feel like I would like literally give up anything right now to play in a shitty Journey cover band at a bar <laughs> yeah. with a bunch of people going, hey, play play the song you're playing right now. Can you yeah, play? I mean. I, I would kill I don't care for that if too. People there. I just want to want to play again. Uh, yeah, we're supposed to play actually. Uh, our first show is supposed to be May 29th in Chicopee, Mass, uh, at a place called Geraldine's, and we're opening it up for an ACDC tribute band. Which one? So, Back in Black. Oh, I don't know them. So what what we're gonna do with this band too? We're also gonna do covers. So we're gonna mix up some covers and uh, some originals and and go out there and see what happens. Nice. So, so the, 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 May twenty ninth. So, so May twenty ninth. And, and and what what kind of covers are we thinking? Are you are you breaking the cat out of the bag in the sense that people are gonna know? Like is this cause I know the killers made their way into Vegas by infiltrating by playing covers and then slowly uh putting in their own tunes and then just stealing the show. So what we're doing is seventies, eighties, nineties hard rock and metal. So yes. everything from like Sabbath. Van Halen, uh, and then then we'll do eighty stuff like we'll do Guns N' Roses, uh, Skid Row, and we'll do some guns it's like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains. So it's kind of like everything seventies, eighties, nineties, hard rock, metal. That's awesome. That's awesome, dude. And do you feel like playing some of those tunes is inspiring you? Like, I mean, again, you know, uh, I, I am so envious of the fact that you're even getting in a basement with somebody. And like, I wasn't even trying to be facetious in the sense, like I am writing with people and sending them tracks. Like, you know, I've never met David Abruzzese. He's thousands of miles away, but I've done tunes with him and all that. And that's great. But like, I would kill to get into a room with some people and like, just see what happens. You play the bass and I play the guitar and the keyboards. And like, what does that sound like? And have my ears ring for just yeah. one night. <laughs> and one thing is like I, I I don't like going into a jam not having anything. Like I don't just like to just all right, come up well I'm just gonna see what happens. Like uh I like to go in like all right, I have a blueprint of where mm -hmm. I wanna go, but I love everybody coming together and throwing in ideas and seeing what works the best and like I said, a lot of times somebody else in the band would be like, Well you maybe you should we should do this and I'm like that that makes it right there. I would have never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. Collaborating yeah. real time, like feedback yeah. is is. So I've always lost. liked that. Yeah, 
That's something I miss out on a lot as a string player because, you know, in almost every situation I go into something and there's like a part written and you're like not even supposed to say anything. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, I mean, so many times I want to. Well, having you, know? you solo on the record, it was like literally like break. You're like, is anyone watching? Am I allowed to do this? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. like you almost, I, I feel like you were scared that Big Brother was going to strike you down. Yeah, well, that's what I have to say about, about Lost Symphony is that, yeah, that broke me out of my comfort zone in a lot of ways because it's like classical music training is so stringent and it's like you must stay in the box and like you know there's a little bit of room for creativity but not when it comes to notes or ideas it's like there's very small margins for self-expression mm-hmm. yeah and there's, well, there's very little writing involved unless you're a, a composer and that's considered like a completely different category from being a yeah violinist. See, that, that's that's total opposite world for me because i could never play somebody's stuff note for note so yeah like, well i it's it's hard and it's I mean for me yeah it's taken a long time to break out of the shell yeah. of even learning and you're how under to do a, that. you're under a microscope by people who know their stuff yeah, <laughs> yeah. all yeah. the time yeah we're working on we're working on a track that that has some well known pieces and uh, <laughs> Siobhan's having like this like anxiety attack of like it's oh like my god people are gonna hear this is a well known uh, everyone's gonna hear me play this oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah one of my could've... favorite things I, <laughs> I John handle like, that we... job. Yeah. We had we had Siobhan uh, collaborating with Marty Friedman, and by collaborating, I mean more of like she was just making Marty Friedman's ideas come to life in a very painful way for herself. And there was one time where Marty had said something to the extent of like this note was wrong, and Siobhan is like so humble and so like laid back, but you can't tell her when she's gone to school and like is is uni- university trained and studious that like that her note was wrong when she was very deliberate with whatever said note was so she actually yeah. like pulled him aside figuratively yeah. an email Again. and set him set him straight and then he was like yeah you're probably right like i i guess i just <laughs> it wasn't my note but like it was hilarious to have marty friedman like get called out by Siobhan because uh, he's that, sadistic that's got to be great to have that knowledge i wish i could do that Oh, wow. Shut down, I, people. <laughs> no, but it's it, it's you know it's it's a blessing and a curse in some ways because yeah you feel like boxed in by the rules a lot of the time where it's like oh you're writing a part and it's like oh no this is not proper voice leading I just hear like my teacher is like yeah. in the back of my head you know so it's like it it can really cage you in in a lot of ways so well, I, how, I don't how is say writing I the, you, but. the the ba- so I have to ask you then this because we wrote. Uh, we, we have a song called Decomposing Composers on Chapter 3, and this was something I talked about with Ollie when he was uh, still on this planet, um, which I had no idea uh, if you're saying there's something to do with Monty Python. I just came up with the idea because I thought it was a funny pun. I had no idea it was a Monty Python thing until Corey was like, did you know that was Monty Python? I didn't know that either. But I, I had no I idea. Know. I had fucking no idea. Um, but uh, <laughs> the point is is that you do um, Paganini, and first off, such a breakneck uh, speed, but that's a solo violin piece and my brother Brian had written a counterpart to it. I remember Corey and I like pain through it. We recorded the drums twice. He recorded the bass. And then you come in and you're like, oh no. <laughs> oh, all, all this is wrong. And like the whole song is like chromatically insane. It's the same guy that wrote uh, Play the Bumblebee. Um, in, uh, it's like Ingve Malmsteen's Wet Dream. So yeah, she's playing yeah. this shit. So she's like, no, we can't do this. And you sat down and you wrote the bass motion. What was that like? having to sit down and write bass motion to one of Paganini's caprices, knowing that all these classical people may be scrutinizing you. And how does that even work? Well, yeah, it definitely still gives me anxiety about what people will say. But no, I mean, it's just um, that's something you have to learn. I mean, it reminded me of like music theory classes in college. It's like when you play Bach, you have to learn how to extrapolate like... No, but okay, violin like guitar in a lot of ways, but we can't play chords. We can play double stops, but it's primarily a melodic instrument, right? So almost all the lines we play, you have to understand the underlying harmony to make it musical. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of notes going in random directions. So that's really all it was, was like, what is the implied chord going on between all these notes? So yeah, it was painful, but... (laughs) (laughs) Well, this because... So so people understand... So John understands. She's playing it at 166 BPM, which to my knowledge... It might be the fastest I've ever heard anyone record that. It's it's scary fast. And 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 I know that Rusty Cooley and I'll call him out had said like, hey, maybe I'll do it. He disappeared when you said that speed. <laughs> and and he he's did. one of the he fastest. He's yeah. one of the fastest. But here's the thing that people need to understand: that even if you're the fastest guitar player, you're still not close to the fastest violinist. No, no, I, I, cause I, I mean, I've learned so much from guitar players, even through Lost Symphony. It's like in the violin world, it's different. There are a lot of things that are easier on violin than they are on guitar. 
I mean, the way what people you, use the pick. Sorry, go ahead. What do you think? What do you think when you hear like stuff like Ingbe? Do you do you like that? Yeah, I mean, I do. It's it's interesting because I like the world of metal was so separated for me because I always growing up, I never thought of it as being in any way related to classical music. And then I started to discover people like Ingve and realizing like, oh, my God, there's such a heavy class. You know, it's neo. Do you hear him and, like, and, and do you hear him and go, oh, that's totally Vivaldi winter? No, yeah. no. I mean, I hear I hear quotations, of course, like like pieces that are sort of excerpts from classical mm -hmm. stuff. But mm -hmm. I mean, like I've looked at some of the stuff, like pulled tabs, you know, tried to find sheet music for it. I'm like, this is madness. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. even know if this is playable on violin. It's just it's totally it's incredible. It's just off the wall. Yeah, it's weird. The the difference because just because of the tunings like that one, like the, you know, yeah. the, the fourths and fifths. And it's just like it's like, all right, well, that now this makes us completely foreign to this instrument. Right. So it's it, yeah. you don't that, even have frets. Yeah. No, well, intonation is is super hard on, but it applies to guitar too. I'm sure in some ways, but yeah, it's that. No, that's guitarists hard, don't but... care about intonation, dude. I <laughs> no, can barely no, play intonated. I know. With I was just playing the other the day snark. in my basement. My guitar was so intonation is garbage. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is terrible. Just bend it. Guitar just bend it. <laughs> guitar players are so great with articulation, though, and that's what I've learned a lot is like the clarity that they get with the picking hand and like the. the I mean, that's always been inspiring. Yeah, when you play Murder of Crows with Jimmy Bell, I can understand where you get that. <laughs> that's no, not everybody, in, Siobhan. Maybe it's not everybody, but I mean, it's something people can learn from different instruments all the time. I mean, I'm surprised that more violinists don't study guitar players, even if it's not classically inspired. Don't music. you snub your nose at guitar players, though? Or isn't like violin? No, I don't. Like a little I bit. <laughs> not you. I mean, violinists as a whole. Isn't like a more elitist? Like if you don't joust, you're certainly not going to be talking about your equestrian travels on the weekend. <laughs> I think I think it's changing, but I think you're right. I think the problem is it's just foreign. You know, a lot of classical violinists they're they're sent away to school, and you're in this this system of school. You know, and you're you're kind of in this bubble away from the outside world and away from people that are building careers and writing music and you know becoming very skilled players without school. Mm. You know, and so there's this weird like lack of communication between these two groups. So I think, that, yeah, there may be a little bit of snubbing, but I think it's more just like they don't know how to interact with these people because they come from a different system. You know, whereas I admire that. I think that's amazing. You know, like, I, I, I feel, so I feel like more. I feel like there's a metaphor that happened in my life that explains the difference between metal and classical. I was at uh, I was in Malibu. I stopped at a Starbucks all right, I was standing behind Pierce That's Brosnan so bougie from fucking no, no, seriously, and he was being a dickhead at Starbucks or whatever. And I walk outside. I'm wearing an Iron Maiden Live After Death shirt, a shirt that Mark Lopes heckled me for wearing at so many concerts that I had to retire it. And this beautiful, lovely blonde lady comes up to me and she goes, "Are you wearing an Iron Maiden shirt?" And I'm like, "Yeah." I feel like that didn't happen because no, like, who you know, the hell she, would say she, that no, to she's, someone wearing I'll tell an you Iron Maiden said, shirt? I'll say, she said, she goes, I've been living here for five years and I've never seen an Iron Maiden shirt in Malibu. And I'm like, well, I love Maiden, like up the irons. And she's like, my husband's the guitarist. And I'm like, oh. which one? Wow. And she goes, Adrian Smith. I'm like, the good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, but like, I swear to God, I, I met Adrian Smith's wife, and she like called me out for wearing an Iron Maiden shirt in Malibu because everyone there drives an Aston Martin, and like, whether you have the Vanquish or the V8 determines whether you get like the front line privileges at Starbucks. Yeah, well, I live in Miami, where it's like classical music is almost completely foreign. It's like I'm the ol I'm the only violinist I know in my whole neighborhood because they speak Spanish. Know? It is foreign. It's, no, it's not just that. It's just a cultural. Yeah, it's like it's it's not the type of music people are into necessarily. I mean, even everything, all the classical ensembles, there's some element of like crossover stuff. You have to include other things in your concerts. Do you need me to come to DJ with you guys? Like, do you want me to come with the orchestra and I'll oh, DJ yeah, yeah, with you, you guys? Like Ingve did when Ingve flew like here. overseas <laughs> and played with the whole orchestra and wore like the Bach frills. I'll do that with the DJ tables. <laughs> While you have the whole orchestra playing, and I'll be like the conductor. Yeah, no, it's it's wild, different worlds. Yeah, With John, are you enjoying this? Are you having fun? Like, is this is have you? Because you said you watched Twenty Twenty. Yeah. You genuinely enjoyed it, like really? <laughs> yeah, I I just listened to the Steve Stevens one, and I I listened to the Paul Geary one, um, Satchel. So I was like. That's why I was like, fuck, what the hell am I going to do on this? I don't, I can't, I have nothing to say after these guys. Did you think to yourself <laughs> that like, I didn't know that that would be the things that like got under Satchel's skin? I love, I think the guy's off. He's a, he's a comedian and, a, and an amazing oh, guitar totally. player. Oh, totally. 
<laughs> he's the best. Yeah, I mean, huh, yeah. that guy's and, so underrated. At and funny too. enough, he's, probably took like the most like hard stance out of any of our guests ever on a, on the show. As far teachers as like, unions, yeah. <laughs> on teachers unions, that was the thing. That was his platform. The greatest thing like, is like it, it, he'll never get in trouble because he's in Steel yeah, Panthers. You can right. say whatever the fuck you want, right? You know, there's never going to be anyone like yeah. There, there's going to be people bitching about it, but it, it's like. Good. He's but like the Stephen Colbert of metal. Yeah, well, and he's like, in character, you know. So it's like he he can have that persona with it's almost like somewhat separated from yeah, you know, what his real life. You know what I mean? It's got to it's got to be great to have that shield. Yeah. <laughs> Do the Anthrax guys like Steel Panther? Because I know bands like Motley Crue have like a big um, beef, you know, because they think they're making I, fun of them. I know a couple of the guys do because we play with them in Spain and. uh and we were, I was, I was with a couple of the dudes and we were, we were fucking smiling the whole time and loving it. That's awesome. Well, cause those guys are all good friends of ours. And I, and I think it's so fucking lame. I'll say it. I think it's lame when people, you take yourself way too seriously. If Steel Panther offends you as a person in a band. Yeah. Well, I, I'm almost impossible to get offended. So I, I, I love them. I, yeah. Well, it's an interesting world we live in, you know? Oh yeah. I think everyone's offended <laughs> all the time. So what's the next ste steps for Anthrax? Like what uh, what's going on? Is Charlie sending you demos? Like are you working? Are you just doing the living I, wreckage thing? Like yeah, bro, well, I've been concentrating that. I know Charlie and I, those other guys have been uh, writing. So um, hopefully we'll be in the studio sometime this year to finish that up for the new Anthrax. And um, yeah, so and then uh, I, until. Uh, until we get in the studio with Anthrax and, and get going with that again, I'm just going to uh, be doing this. Yeah. Does it seem like any other shows or talk of tours on the horizon? I know with my band, it's kind of like we have no idea. I mean, there's just sort I, of. Yeah, I know crickets. we were supposed to do some shows this summer, but, you know, they were booked and they were announced. But as far as, you know, I'm, I think we're, everyone's on the same page and nobody knows what the fuck's going to happen. You just. You keep your fingers crossed the whole time. Right. Well, I certainly, I certainly hope that I can go see some live shows. I, I certainly hope that if if COVID and, and being locked down has taught us anything, it's to appreciate music, to appreciate what everyone on this does and how hard we work to, to bring music to people and the reality of how unrewarding it is and how hard it is to be in a band like i mean it's it's hard to hear that you know guys in shadows fall couldn't be in the band because they're just you know you you have to make a financial decision it's a financial mm -hmm. decision and i'm sure you probably had band uh, people coming after you for years oh you why would you fucking break up you guys were so awesome and it's like yeah dude like, well, people are always like even when we when uh the news came out that matt and i were starting a new band like everyone a lot of people are bummed that it's not Shadow Twelve. I'm like, well, listen, it for Shadow Fall to even get in a room, it just costs money. Like, you got to get on a plane. Like, it's right. I don't, you know, it's like I don't want to. If we do Shadow Twelve, like I said, I don't, I don't like doing the email thing. I want to be, I want to be in a basement jamming. So, uh, maybe someday it'll happen when when there's different circumstances. But right now, that's it's not going to happen at, at this time. Right. Well, I think a lot of people, you know, it's hard for them to understand all of the stuff that goes on before what they hear. You know, it's like way more than you would even think. Yeah. So you know, but I think yeah, I, it's, I, it's, I, it's, everyone. It's, some stuff is just not that easy to just be like, all right, let's, let's get together. It's just a lot of, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of obstacles to all get well, together. I was going to say one of the good things that ended up happening is from this though, was because of the nature of lost symphony, we were putting, we're putting together a tribute record for Ollie. Um, you know, you got to play on chapter two, which we were totally stoked and actually features Ollie. Um, and this, this, this next record, um, you know, we knew when we were calling people uh, into it, like, what are you doing, bro? Like, what are you actually doing? So like, it, like, cause everyone was staying home and recording. So like a lot of people who I know who would never, uh, we would never have gotten in front of. Uh, a yeah. lot of these like fantasies that we came up with, I had the time yeah. to to make come to fruition S for speaking, Ollie. And, real, and, and, real speaking of Ollie, uh, John, I'm, I'm sure that that you played, you guys played together. You, you, yeah. You know, can, can, I, you I talk, can you I talk a little? Can you talk a little? Yeah. Can you talk about Ollie. Ollie a little bit? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
back, man, it might have been late 90s. I, I took some lessons from Ollie. Uh, we were both going to uh, a, the Holyoke Community College together. And uh, I just knew he was a super ripping guitar player who knew everything inside and out about theory and stuff. So, uh, yeah, he, he used to come over to, uh, to my parents' house and, and, and show me some stuff. And it just, he was another guy, just super amazing and like not, not even a little bit of an ego. Just yeah, I was going to say, what's, what was Ollie nice like guy. in college? What, what was college Ollie like? Collie? I, see, like, I didn't. <laughs> like, I didn't really know him too well, but I just knew him as, I didn't go to college for music, but I took yeah. some um, music courses. So he was like the other metal guy, I would see. Like, we were like the only two long hair guys in the, <laughs> in the, in the music building. And, uh. Were you guys competing he, on the quad? Like, were, was he one day playing, you know, uh, Queen Strike, and you were playing <laughs> Sacred Reich well, over I, there, and you're trying to get I, the same girls and hated each other? I just, I didn't even hear him play until then. Then I saw him with all their man, and I was like, "Holy shit, this guy's a ripper, man!" Like, wow. And and then, uh, yeah, we just, you know, us and all their mains kind of came up at the same time, so we were all friends, and uh, just he was one of those guys that nobody was playing guitar like that back then because he was super schooled and playing metal. And there wasn't a lot of guys on the scene uh, back then in the late nineties who really knew their theory inside out and had that technical ability that he did. Yeah. Yeah. An amazing guy, huh? Yeah. Well, what I was, I was getting at as far as the technical stuff, the people being at home. So we made this record and it's kind of like a bill and Ted story in my mind, because when Ollie was here, we'd have these fictitious conversations, John, where we'd say, mm -hmm. well, what if we got Marty Friedman? Well, we can't get Marty Friedman unless we get Nuno Betancourt. <coughs> well, we can't get Nuno without blah, blah, blah. And Ollie, because he, people respected him. He had his DVD out. <coughs> he played Chip Rock, you know, with David Elfson and Bumblefoot and all these people. And he'd come back and be like, I think, I think we could call Bumblefoot and he would play on our record. I'm like, really? That dude is outrageous like the guy from mega no, shut up and he started giving right. us <clears throat> credibility so when he passed there wasn't a there's, there's nothing i can do as far as what's going on um you know with him I, I can't control whether he's here or not but what i can control is making a making something that he'd be proud of because i know that one of the things he used to always say was you know i i you know, there's keyboard warriors. You understand this. Like, your last album was better than this album. Or this song's pussy. Or fuck these three songs. And why can't you make every song like that? And Ollie was sensitive to that. Because he really did care what people thought as much as, you know, it's it's it was art to him. He's like, I'm a composer. Like, why don't you see the, yeah. the value in this? And so when he said, when we talked about Lost Symphony, one of the things I used to always say to him is, no one is going to question you now, bro. Like, where is there anything to, like, shit on with what you're doing? So when we made Chapter 3, I, I had to pull out all the stops. And fortunately, because Ollie, you know, made such an impression on so many people, we were able to put together some stuff that, like, is outrageous. So, for example, um, I, I don't think we've talked about it openly exactly, but the first single that's on um, this next record uh, features... Nuno, Marty Friedman, Richard Shaw from Cradle of Filth, yeah, he's Kelly, awesome too. and Alex Skolnick. Oh, and wow. we got Alex because I, when I talked to Angel Vivaldi, who's also on the record, um, one of the things he said to me was he remembered staying up all night arguing his favorite Skolnick solos with Ollie. And I didn't realize because I, it's not that I don't like Testament, but I guess they eluded me a little bit. Um, and it turns out our marketing guy, Jason, convinced this, the Alex Skolnick trio to play his wedding. He, like, duped them into playing his wedding. And now he's friends <laughs> with Alex Skolnick. So <laughs> he first off, he came on 2020. But then he played with uh, on two of our tunes for Ollie. And um, we have Skolnick, Marty Friedman, and Nuno all playing together. Those are, on, like, my top favorite guys. 
That's awesome. Me yeah, too. Same, yeah. And Ollie, it was the joke. It was literally yeah. the joke. He yeah. would say like, dude, oh, I think we should get Friedman. And obviously, I, I, I'm a betting court guy. And I do love Friedman. Don't get me wrong. I love them all. And then Skolnick was, was, you know, obviously his thing. And then... For me, Kelly is the modern, like, he's the, one of the few guitar players other than maybe Jimmy Bell that's, like, wowed me. And then Richard Shaw, if you listen to that guy, he's, like, the the shred Dave Gilmore. Like, he's, like, if Dave Gilmore decided to play shreddy, uh, because he has so much tone, he has so much feel, and he plays with that new school technique, but without mm -hmm. sounding like a clone or right. like, you know, one of those mindless dudes that's like, okay, I understand Andy James and Jason Richardson are unbelievable guitar players, but there's so many guys doing that exact same thing and it makes me want to pull my eyes out. Yeah. So, and rant. <laughs> yes. I, like, your, your rants just have this like wall. It's like, yeah, there, I'm, there's nowhere I'm, to go from I'm there. I'm done what is speaking to say? and seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great place to to wrap up, I guess, because we're coming yeah. up at the end of our second hour. John, thank you so much, man. Obviously, if you guys want to check out a little band called Anthrax, a little band called Shadows Fall, and uh, by the time this comes out, hopefully we'll all be able to check out uh, Living Wreckage. I'm, I'm and check out Let pumped. Us Pray, because John... Uh, uh, yeah, that's who, a great band, too. Who's yeah. the drummer uh, in, in, in this John's band? So the John, the Johns, J and J, uh, Music Factory going on over here. Plays with Mark Lopes or Lopez, uh, the Orange Dealer, um, that also moonlights with a guy named Ross the Boss, uh, who played in a band called Man of War, and uh, he he's just he's just the metal dude. And and John is so capable, and you should hear him play guitar because as much as I love hearing him play drums on your record, yeah, he's, killer. he's he's killer. So if you guys want to hear like two metal bands. Uh, living wreckage I can tell you I heard the stuff and I and I wrote John like an email that he totally didn't even need to read because like he didn't ask my opinion but I'm like this is how it made me feel <laughs> um, and I sent him tunes back because I was inspired so like I think you're gonna really dig it and I, I think I speak on behalf of everyone that's ever listened to anything heavy ever that we can't wait for the next anthrax record and please you know come back on when yeah. anything happens and also make sure you oh, check out sure. uh, yeah check out Lost Symphony Chapter 2 Murder of Crows, the video is online. We'll post a link to it in the description. But you know, Jimmy John, Bell. John, John kills it. Jimmy Bell. Um, yeah. They they let the bassist play guitar, and I got I got a little bit of a solo in there. So I'll, I'll Ooh, take I'll take you credit. Killed it too. <laughs> Here's an actual quote from Tim Osmond. Um, John Denice um, is so great that he doesn't even trip over his own arpeggios. That's, That's a Tim not Osmond from Tim Osmond. No, <laughs> <laughs> you've been 2020. Thank you, John Denae. Thank right. you so much, John. All awesome right. no, to meet thanks you. Thanks for having me. Everyone, take care, man. I, I when I was 12 years old, I think I heard Molly Crew for the first time, and I fucking loved it. And their records are great. Shout out to the Devil. To me, it's their best record. It's a great record. Um, they've got a lot of great songs. Um, you know, they're, they're they've always sucked live. Uh, you know, <laughs> Vince Dale cannot sing, and he know he he knows that Vince doesn't. I don't think Vince has ever watched a video and went, "Yeah, fucking nailed that." 